Power Rangers Time Force was considered as one of the best seasons of Power Rangers ever. With its mature tone and amazing storytelling, what would the show have up its sleeve next? Power Rangers Wild Force is a landmark moment in the franchise's history for many important reasons. It was the 10th anniversary of the show, but it would also be the last season of Power Rangers under the Saban umbrella, and now under the rule of a certain mouse-shaped overlord. And heck, it was almost the final season of Power Rangers, period! Yeah, there's a lot to cover in this Wild Force adventure. Hyakuju Sentai Gao Ranger was the 25th season of Super Sentai, following a team of superheroes who want to protect the Earth and all of its nature and beauty from evil. Simple, but effective. So, if Wild Force really was supposed to be the true finale of Power Rangers, again, then how would they go out? What would happen to this beloved franchise celebrating its 10th anniversary? Let's find out. Episode 1, Lionheart. We start off with this Tarzan-looking guy named Cole. He lives in the jungle with his tribe. One night, though, there's a ceremony in his honor. He's given a red crystal and a picture of presumably his family. So, Cole sets off on a journey to the big city to find his destiny. Meanwhile, we see a group of rangers fighting off a monster, who we'll learn is from an evil race known as Orgs. The monster runs away and the rangers demorph, saying they need another ranger to battle the sudden rise of Orgs. We have Max, the Blue Ranger, Danny the Black Ranger, Alyssa the White Ranger, yeah, no pink this season, and Taylor the Yellow Ranger. Taylor's saying they're doing just fine and don't need any help. At a different part of town, we see these two bumbling idiots trying to steal a dog. It turns out they're actually powerful org generals named Toxica and Gingerax. They're survivors from a great org war centuries ago, and wish their leader would return. The next morning, the rangers find Cole and try to convince him to go with them. He's a bit hesitant, but Taylor takes care of that. <laughs> Sorry, Jungle Boy, you've just been drafted. Cole eventually comes too, seeing that he's on this beautiful island full of Zords roaming free. He bonds with the Red Lion, realizing that this exact lion is in his crystal. We're then introduced to Princess Shayla, the most Disney princess to ever exist. Hello, friends. I am Princess Shayla. She'll essentially be the mentor for this season. We learn that this land is called the Animarium, a giant turtle-shaped island floating in the sky, acting as a sanctuary to the Wild Zords. Princess Shayla tells Cole that it's his destiny to be the leader of the Wild Force Rangers. Again, he's hesitant at first, but when he sees the other rangers also have animal crystals and witnesses the orgs destroying the Earth, feeling the animals in fear of their lives, he immediately agrees. Taylor gives him his morpher and instinctively knows what he has to do. Wild access! Wild access! All five rangers morph into the Wild Force Rangers for the first time, and it's awesome! They lay the smackdown on the monster using their unique fighting styles and code names. The Soaring Eagle retracts its wings and does aerial combat. The Surging Shark has a powerful bite. The Iron Bison uses brute strength and power to overwhelm the enemy. The Noble Tiger is quick and agile, and the Blazing Lion is fearless and strong. It's honestly so cool. I also really love these suits. They look so clean. Fantastic animal-themed helmets, a strong presence of the primary color, with their secondary colors being gold sashes that go along the body. And the suits come complete with these claws that make a cool whip sound when they fight. It just adds to the animal theme overall. They defeat the Org, but Toxica makes it grow big. With her evil peanuts. Princess Shayla then, in a long roundabout way, just says to summon the Zords. I like how they're summoned. They need to use their daggers. They put the animal crystal in it and make a flute sound. Very reminiscent of the Dragon Zord. They don't combine to make the Megazord here, but they just shoot a rainbow beam and destroy the Org. The episode ends with the Rangers celebrating a job well done, ready to take on whatever evil may come their way. Lionheart was a good opening episode. Just like Lightspeed, I guess they decided to not make it a two-parter and just get to the meat of the matter, which I'm all for. This is also the first season to show Rangers already in action. The only other one I could think of is Andros. The Rangers themselves are also very likable from the get-go. Cole is the fish-out-of-water Red Ranger who'll need to learn how to live... Well, not in the jungle. He's kind-hearted, but seemingly naive about what it truly means to be a Power Ranger. Taylor was the original leader of the team. She's strict, but not mean. She cares for the team, but someone needs to be the one to whip everyone into shape. Danny is a gentle giant. He's big and buff, but shy and awkward. Just think of Eduardo from Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. Max is the youngest of the group. He's always the one cracking jokes and being more emotional than the others. Alyssa? She's there. A nice, kind girl. That's about it so far. 
Princess Shayla, as I mentioned before, is such a Disney princess. Good lord, her character is just whimsical and happy and smiley. I can already tell she's gonna be kind of annoying. Toxica and Gingerax are also the only ties to the main villain so far. They're just comic relief, bumbling idiots doing some evil things. But of course, the main ingredient to any Power Rangers season is the theme song. So, how is Wild Forces? Whoops, look at that, another banger! We've literally not had a single bad opening theme so far. The whole WOW FORCE has so much energy, and the instrumentals are perfect for a morphing sequence or Megazord summon. They even got the... How very Lost Galaxy of you. Now, before we really talk about the Disney era and the End of Saban era, let's actually go through this season a bit and see what we got in store. With the next episode, Darkness Awakening. Gingerax and Toxica make it to their lair, and are greeted by their ruler, Master Org. He starts rambling off some exposition, but even the show doesn't really care, focusing on the two saying that their leader seems a bit off. Meanwhile, Cole is adjusting to his new life as the leader of the Power Rangers. Him and Taylor get into an argument, however, when Cole mentions that maybe violence isn't the answer. Cole wants to instead talk it out and make peace. Taylor, however, says that's pointless. The orgs are evil through and through. It's a really good episode. The other rangers are trying to have Taylor go easy on Cole since he's new, but also siding with her. Telling Cole that she was the first ranger recruited on the team and knows about the orgs the most. Cole is a peaceful person who doesn't want to resort to violence. He tries to read the orgs heartbeat and connect with it, but can't feel anything. Needing to learn the hard way that he has no choice but to fight. So, the moral of this episode is sometimes people are unredeemable and need to be smacked around. I love it. The Rangers also create the Wild Zord for the first time, and wow, this is the first Megazord sequence to be done with CGI. It's a bit rough, but it's not awful, and I can't blame them. Luckily, the fights themselves never resort to CG. The episode ends with the Rangers cheering up Cole with a haircut and presenting him with his new team jacket which he of course rips the sleeves off of and makes a bandana. I love these Wild Force jackets. I would unironically wear this out and about. Click, click, zoom. Cole is reading the Wild Force rule book and doesn't agree with it, saying there's only one rule they need to follow. Teamwork. Taylor is like me for real and gets sick of that, angrily storming off. Princess Shayla explains to Cole that Taylor was the one who wrote that book. It's possible that Taylor feels a bit disrespected with Cole showing up and saying everything she's done is wrong. We then get Princess Shayla's backstory. I don't really pay attention when she talks. There was a war between her forces and the orgs. I don't know, it's not that deep. Just then, an org attacks Turtle Cove, turning Taylor invisible. Cole feels like this is his fault and tries to fight the org on his own. But wait, what happened to teamwork? The rest of the episode has Cole and Taylor needing to learn to respect each other's methods of leadership, which of course they eventually do, becoming besties for life. Never give up. We learn that Danny has a crush on this girl named Kendall, who works at a flower shop. Danny also worked there prior to becoming a ranger, but never told her how he felt. The two of them catch up, and Danny offers his time to help make some flower deliveries. This angers Max, because Danny said he'd help him investigate a ghost. Later that night, Max does so by himself, but gets spooked by a bump in the night, getting hurt in the process. This leads to the two getting into a fight. It's very realistic. We feel for Danny because he's a big, lovable creature who's just too shy to tell Kendall how he feels. But Max is the youngest of the group. He's naturally gonna be a bit more immature. So Max storms off, eventually running into an org and fighting it by himself. However, he gets captured. The rest of the team then go out to find Max, Danny being the most worried. We learn that when Danny first joined the team, Max saved his life, instilling in him the mantra, never give up and they've been best friends ever since. The Rangers eventually find Max in the org. Max is trapped inside this bell with limited air supply, and Danny goes charging in to save Max while constantly getting blasted at. And the two share the most beautifully cheesy moment in Power Rangers ever. Motivated by friendship, Danny takes down the monster and saves Max. The two make up and take on the org. United we rule! That's right, the power of friendship is so beautiful. I don't think I've mentioned this yet, but the Rangers' final attack is where they stack all their weapons together and create the Jungle Sword. And with one giant slash, the day is saved. The episode ends with Danny writing Kendall a letter expressing his love. However, he gets nervous and hides it in a flower. 
But when he leaves, Kendall immediately finds the letter and reads it. Thank goodness. Now we don't have to watch Danny fumble the bag for the entire season. Ancient Awakening Alyssa's college class is going on a field trip. They're going on an archaeological dig. During this dig, however, Alyssa hears and feels another animal spirit. She returns later that day with Princess Shayla to investigate, but gets captured by Gingerax and Toxica. As well as a... tire org? Wait a minute, I know where this is going! <laughs> yep, the Wild Zords create the Wild Cycles or something, now available at Target. So yeah, it's mostly motorcycle shenanigans with the Rangers. Back at the cave, we see that Master Org is confronting Princess Shayla. He says that only one pure of heart can release the animal inside. However, Alyssa shows up and sends them packing, and with her pure heart, gains a new animal crystal, the Elephant Zord, which is able to come apart and act as a sword and shield for the Wild Zord. Apparently, there's a lot more animal zords lying dormant after the Great Org War. Wishes on the Water Cole is looking at his long-lost parents, and Taylor tries to comfort him, showing a picture of her squadron, since she was once in the Air Force. The main story follows Alyssa reading Max and Danny a story. Why? They're adults. Apparently, if you write a wish on a piece of paper and put it in a bottle and throw it into Turtle Cove Lake, your wish will come true. Max gets excited at this idea and secretly goes off to make his wish. Later that night, an org shows up and Max sees that his bottle is trapped inside the org. This, for some reason, worries him. He's embarrassed because he's sick of being treated like a kid, so I guess he just doesn't want the other rangers to find out he made a wish so they don't make fun of him? I really like Max's portrayal in this show. He really does come off like a kid trying his best to grow up and fit in. Also, throughout the episode, Max has been having visions of the future and hearing voices. It turns out this was another Wild Zord calling out to him because of his probably pure heart. So Max connects with the Wild Zord, and it turns out to be a giraffe. What? This whole episode was water themed. Whatever. With the giraffe at the ranger's disposal, they destroy the org. The episode ends with Max trying again with his wish, but this time, Danny is there to fully support him. Max's wish is that he wants the team to treat him like an adult. The Bare Necessities While out for a jog, Taylor comes across an Air Force base, where she starts to reminisce on the past. It's here we learn a bit of Taylor's backstory. While out flying one day, she catches a glimpse of the Animarium. However, she can't contact anyone and ends up crashing on the island. It's here she runs into Princess Shayla, and she's like, Yo, you wanna fight evil? And just like that, she's all aboard. I don't know how the military works. I don't think you can just leave like that. The main story follows these two kids showing up everywhere Taylor goes. An org attacks downtown, and Taylor needs to do battle by herself. She fights off the putrids. I don't even think I've mentioned them yet. They're this season's foot soldiers. Once again, just goofy guys in spandex. Now, I haven't watched Gal Ranger, but this episode screams Sentai. During a fight with an org, Taylor gets injured. These two kids show up again and heal her with their magic powers. They then ask for Taylor's help to go to the bottom of this ravine to grab a flower. She does so, and the kids are thankful. They both reward her with two beans. The rangers then defeat the org, and when it grows, the kids show up again, and the magic flower transforms them into zords. The black bear and polar bear. You see what I mean? This sounds very Japanese. They destroy the org, but the episode doesn't end well. The megazord completely falls apart the Red Lion not being strong enough to maintain the power of all these new Zords. Soul Searching Princess Shayla tells the Rangers about a mythical creature known as the Soul Bird. In ancient times, this Soul Bird was able to heal any Wild Zord's illness and make them strong again, which is what the Red Lion desperately needs. So, they go on a journey to find the Soul Bird. However, Toxica and Gingerax summon an orc to distract the rangers. A big fight breaks out. The monster grows giant, but with the Red Lion's power levels low, they can't maintain the Megazord for a long time. Cole feels the Red Lion's pain and storms off with a head of steam, when he sees the Soul Bird off in the distance. Just when Cole arrives, though, he's confronted by Master Org, who, eight episodes in, finally does something! Cole tries to fight him head-on, but quickly gets disposed. During the fight, though, Cole drops his family picture, and when Master Org picks it up, he recognizes them. We get a flashback of Master Org attacking Cole's parents with vines. Because of this fighting, the Soul Bird flies away. Master Org then leaves as well, saying that the Soul Bird has never been seen or found by the same person twice. Just then, though, Cole gets another animal crystal. Because of his... pure heart. I guess. Again. This is able to summon the Gorilla Zord, which can actually form the Megazord without the Red Lion, being named the Konga Zord. They defeat the Yorg, and even though they can form a new Megazord, 
they're of course not just gonna let the Red Lion die. When Cole returns to the original Soulbird location, he spots something. An egg that was laid by the Soulbird. Cole is happy at first, but realizes the bird will never know its mother. Just like him. Soulbird Salvation. Honestly, not much happens. Most of the episode goes on as normal. An org shows up and the rangers gotta fight it. So, Princess Shayla does a ritual to hatch the Soulbird. All the rangers can ride it, which is pretty cool. I guess it just acts as a battery that goes into the Megazord, and boom, the Red Lion is back to its full power. They defeat the monster and the day is saved. There is something interesting though. One of the Org Generals says that he doesn't recognize Master Org, and in a panic, Master Org destroys him. Huh. Now, we're about to enter our first real story arc for Wild Force, but I quickly want to talk about some behind the scenes stuff. In 2002, Disney would acquire Power Rangers as a part of a massive buyout of Fox Family Worldwide. So, this is technically both a Saban and Disney-owned season. Disney technically owned the property and franchise, but Wild Force was already being filmed and worked on with the Saban team. However, when Disney realized they owned Power Rangers, they initially just wanted to cancel it and instead air reruns. So, in a weird way, without anyone's knowledge, this was going to be the last season of Power Rangers. I mention this now because so far the season just feels kinda... eh? Which I'm honestly kinda surprised at considering how mature and well-paced Time Force was. I don't know all the behind the scenes stuff or if Disney really interfered at all with the season, but hey, we're only 9 episodes in, I shouldn't judge too hard yet. So now let's move on to our first real story arc. Curse of the Wolf. Master Org can't stop thinking about Cole, so recruits a new general, General Nazor, and tells him to go to the cemetery. The rangers catch wind of this and do battle. They fight all the way from the city to the cemetery. However, with the distraction of another Org, General Nazor is able to sneak away. After performing a ritual, someone... or something comes out. A wolf creature named Zanaku. He pummels the rangers without breaking a sweat, even managing to steal Alyssa's elephant animal crystal, and freezes it. He threatens the rest of the rangers, saying he'll let them live for now, but next time, they won't be so lucky. Zanaku is awesome. His costume is so cool and his voice is intimidating. To carry out 3,000 years of vengeance. Battle of the Zords. The rangers have some pretty low morale after losing their last battle. Meanwhile, General Nazor, Toxica, and Gingerax are having troubles of their own. Zanaku says he works alone. He's thankful for being resurrected, but says he doesn't take orders from anyone. Alyssa is taking her loss extra hard. She feels guilty for losing the animal crystal, so she goes off on her own to confront Zanaku. She instead runs into Toxica and Gingerax who ambush her, blasting her off a cliff and seriously injuring her. Zanaku finds her at the bottom of the mountain unconscious and tends to her injuries, using a weird concoction to heal her wounds. The rest of the rangers find her, but when she wakes up, she can't remember what happened. So, without being caught off guard this time, the rangers morph. They have a really intense fight. The choreography and music are really good here. The rangers seemingly get the upper hand. That is until Zanaku reveals that he has zords of his own. Dubbed the Dark Wild Zords. They're the wolf, hammerhead shark, and alligator. They easily strike down the Wild Zords, and once again, after his victory, Zanaku leaves. Master Org is furious at this, telling General Nazor to get Zanaku under his command by any means necessary. Predazord Awaken. We see Zanaku playing his flute and having flashbacks of his past, getting imprisoned by five warriors. I forgot to mention, but Zanaku seems to have amnesia, only vaguely remembering who he is. Meanwhile, Max and Danny try to cheer up Alyssa, who's been depressed ever since losing the Elephant Zord. They really are the greatest guys. However, the fun is cut short when a bus org, that's an evil sentient bus that takes people hostage and tries to run them off the road, so the rangers gotta fight it. Eventually, Zanaku shows up and the rangers gotta fight him too. The rangers summon the Wild Zord and defeat the bus org, but Zanaku has another trick up his sleeve. As you could guess, he summons the Dark Wild Zords and is able to combine them to create the Predazord. I love this thing's design. The giant alligator head in the chest and its angry wolf face is so iconic. As you can imagine, the Wild Zord gets absolutely whooped. The Predazord's finishing move has the alligator open its mouth and shoot out a Kamehameha. 
The blast instantly disassembles the Megazord and the animal crystals scatter across the ground. Zanaku spots the giraffe crystal and steals that one for himself as well. Max desperately trying to fight back, but easily gets knocked down. Zenaku now has two of the lost animal crystals under his control. Revenge of Zenaku. We don't waste any time. The rangers show up and have a Megazord fight. This time, however, Zenaku actually uses the elephant and giraffe sword to his advantage, attaching them to the Predazord, beating the rangers once again. However, they get saved by the twin bear zords and gorilla zord. Princess Shayla and Taylor then go out to explore Zanaku's grave, to see if the princess can find any clues about his past. Just then, an org also shows up to attack the city. Because of this distraction, Zanaku is able to capture Princess Shayla. He has an interesting fascination with her, recognizing the necklace she's wearing, but isn't able to remember exactly, but feels like it's important to him, and is the key to regaining his memory. His body then starts to react, almost like something inside is fighting against the evil part of Zanaku. The rangers come to save the princess and do battle with the motorcycle org. Zenaku of course shows up and Taylor fights him one-on-one, -on -one, feeling responsible for the princess getting kidnapped. She puts up a good fight, but it doesn't go well for her, and to add insult to injury, also steals the bear twin's animal crystal for himself. The episode ends with everyone in despair. Identity Crisis Zenaku is having nightmare flashbacks about his past. He's awoken though when a friendly wolf dog approaches him, whom he feels a strong connection and compassion for. The next day, Toxica and Gingerax attack the rangers, with Zenaku of course showing up to join in. During the fight, Toxica shoots a blast and ends up hitting the dog. This immediately infuriates Zenaku, who attacks Toxica and flees the fight to bandage up the dog. Zenaku is struggling more than ever with who he is, now hearing voices from a talking Megazord. During another fight with the rangers, that same Megazord shows up telling Zenaku to try and remember who he is. This Megazord is known as Animus, ancestor of the Wild Zords, and essentially, God. The rest of the episode has the rangers doing battle with Zenaku and actually trying to help him remember his past, which he's clearly hesitant with doing, claiming he's nothing more than a Duke Org. The Ancient Warrior Princess Shayla says Animus showed her a vision. We see that Zanaku was fighting alongside the ancient warriors in the battle against Master Org. However, he proclaims the evil wolf mass is taking control, and he can't control himself anymore. He begs his friends to imprison him so he won't cause harm, which they hesitantly agree to. Princess Shayla believes that Zanaku is actually someone named Merrick, the sixth warrior who fought against Master Org. The rangers also learn that Zanaku gets his powers from a full moon. So, later that night, for some reason, they decide to confront Zenaku. They try to jog his memory, but he doesn't listen, beating them so bad they even get demorphed. Zenaku is about to strike down Cole, but just then, Animus creates an eclipse, causing Zenaku to stand down, and he transforms back into Merrick. Merrick explains what happened. During the Great Org War, the forces of good were losing. Out of desperation, Merrick heard of a cursed wolf mask that would grant the wearer great power. He found the tomb and put on that mask. This granted him the power of the Predazord, which was used to help defeat Master Org. However, because he activated the wolf's power, it took a hold of Merrick and transformed him into Zenaku. The rangers ask for Merrick's help. He agrees when he hears Princess Shayla is alive and assisting the rangers. However, Animus' grip on the Eclipse starts to fail, revealing the moon and transforming Merrick back into Zenaku. Princess Shayla learns that the Dark Zords hold the power of the curse, so she instructs the rangers to destroy it. Danny's Bull Zord starts talking to him, and now has the power of the Rhino and Armadillo Wild Zords. Because why not? He has a pure heart! How very super mega force of you to just give the rangers new powers. This is where things get a little silly, when it really shouldn't. The Rhino and Armadillo Zord can attach to the Wild Zord, where they now unlock the power of Soccer, complete with a Soccer Arena! And the Wild Zord can kick the Armadillo like a ball. They kick the Armadillo straight into the Predazord's chest, and seemingly destroy it and the curse. Freeing Merrick from Zanaku. Princess Shayla arrives on the scene to care for Merrick, happy to see that he's alive and okay, but weirdly runs away when the Rangers show up. The Lone Wolf the rangers welcome Merrick into the team with open arms, however, he feels too guilty for what he's done, harming the rangers and losing their crystals to Master Org, saying he's not worthy to join the team. Later that day, he finds Gingerax and Toxica, but tells them he's on their side, requesting to see Master Org. When he shows up, Merrick tries to get a sneak attack, but fails. He tries calling out to the Predazord, but they don't respond. He's lost contact with his Wild Zords. 
Master Org then takes the twin bear, elephant, and giraffe animal crystals and turns them into an org. The rangers show up and fight, however, they're overpowered by it. Merrick, still feeling guilty, decides to fight the monster head-on without his powers. He puts up a good fight, but constantly gets knocked down. However, he gets up every single time. The Red Lion sees his good heart and calls out to the Predazord. The wolf, alligator, and hammerhead, now broken free from Zanaku's curse, bond with Merrick, and with their power, grants him a morpher. The Lunar Wolf Ranger. With his new power, he's able to single-handedly destroy the org with his sword that turns into a blaster. Again, a staple for Sixth Rangers. His finishing move is, uh... He plays pool with animal crystals. Okay, fine, I'll allow it. When the monster grows big, Merrick is able to create the Predazord, this time with no giant alligator head sticking out in the chest. The finishing blow also isn't a Kamehameha, it's a giant sword strike. But just like Billy Mays, Merrick is still not done yet. He confronts General Nazor and lands his full moon slash, destroying him with one hit. He gives the rangers back their animal crystals, and despite having his new power, still doesn't feel worthy of joining the team. He reconsiders when Princess Shayla is mentioned, but ultimately chooses to go his own way. The Zenaku Silver Ranger Merrick arc was so good, mainly because of its simplicity. A cursed warrior needing to learn the truth and be free. None of the episodes felt like filler. We were constantly seeing Zenaku at odds with the Rangers and himself. There was tons of action, which I can always appreciate. Sometimes an episode just needs to be one long fight scene. Merrick is a really interesting character. Just like Cole, he's an outsider. Being 3,000 years old will do that. He's a veteran warrior who knows his stuff. He's also the first ranger to have a beard. You know, cause he's old. The suit is also really clean. Wolves are always a cool design, but I really like the secondary color being blue. I'm not a color theorist, I don't know why it looks nice, it just does. I'm interested to see where the story goes from here. Great stuff so far, let's see if they keep it up. Power play. We see Merrick has wandered off into a small bar. He beats up a couple of bikers causing trouble, and the owner offers him a job and a place to stay. Meanwhile, Toxica has gone missing. Just then, though, a Toxica-sounding monster attacks the city. All six rangers show up to fight it, only able to send it fleeing for the moment. The rangers once again use this opportunity to try and convince Merrick to join forces. However, he once again turns them down. Princess Shayla heads to the bar to try and have a heart-to-heart -heart with Merrick. It seems that a big reason as to why he won't join the team is because he's fighting his feelings for the princess. There's clearly a romance between the two, but Merrick says it's improper. She's a princess and he views himself as nothing more than her protector. The org returns back to the city and the rangers once again do battle. Merrick this time unlocking his own motorcycle, now available at Target, and they lay the smackdown on the org, who shockingly turns out to be Toxica. She explains how after General Nazor was destroyed, she took his crown and transferred the power to herself. The episode ends with the rangers, I guess, finally convincing Merrick to join the team after Princess Shayla made Merrick a team jacket. Is that really all it took? Secrets and Lies Master Org is torturing Toxica for using Nazor's power on herself, with Jinjirax begging him to give her another chance. Meanwhile, Cole is back on the search for his parents. Alyssa wants to help and has an idea. They go to the library and essentially just look up Cole's parents. They found a newspaper article that's being printed. However, just then, an org attacks the city, and they need to deal with it. The Orc hits Cole with a blast that completely wipes his memory of being a ranger. He wakes up on a farm where a family has taken him in, and since he already has the ability to connect with animals, decides to stay and help out. Meanwhile, Alyssa returns to the library and learns the truth about Cole's parents. The rangers eventually find Cole on the farm, but Alyssa says maybe it's best that he just stays. He's happy here, being a farmer, taking care of animals, and not worrying about his real life. Or learning the truth. It turns out Cole's parents are dead. The article says three scientists and a baby. Everyone starts to agree that maybe Cole is better off not knowing the truth, but it's Taylor who says that it's not fair and he deserves to know. They're able to convince Cole that he's a Power Ranger and that they need his help. He of course joins in and slowly starts to regain his memory. So together they destroy the org and save the day. Meanwhile, Toxica and Jindrax learn that Master Org is a fraud. He is a human. Not only that, he's the third human in that news article that supposedly died alongside Cole and his parents. Before they get the chance to fight, Master Org uses his abilities to brainwash Gingerax and Toxica, transforming their bodies and making them completely loyal to him. The episode comes to an end with Cole visiting his parents' graves. It's a really emotional scene. I 
came all the way down here to find my parents. And all I have left are these gold stones. The other rangers try to comfort Cole, with Taylor giving him some hope. There's a grave there for Cole as well. She says that everyone thinks he died alongside his parents. So, if Cole's alive, maybe his parents survive too. This is a fantastic episode. It's so strange hearing the word death and die in Power Rangers, since usually they try to avoid using that phrase entirely. The tornado spin. Enough of that drama nonsense. This episode features a bowling org. That's right, an org who specializes in bowling. His bowling skills are too powerful for the Rangers. Luckily though, we learn about Max's backstory and origins. He himself was training to be a professional bowler. However, he gave it up to be a Power Ranger. One night on his way home, he saw some girls being attacked by an org. He was afraid at first, but eventually stood up to it, being saved by Alyssa and Taylor, where his shark crystal lit up and knew his destiny has come. He runs into his old bowling sensei, who's bitter at Max for giving up on his bowling career. However, he needs his help to learn the only move that will defeat the bowling org, the tornado spin. This is such a fun and silly episode. Max is like training too hard, hurting himself and going through whatever it takes to learn this ability. It's funny because like, it's bowling. It's not like he's doing karate or punching down a tree. Who hurts themselves this bad bowling? You gotta stop. You can't do this. But I can't. I'm not a quitter. The two make up and Max promises to return back to the bowling alley when his mission is complete. The only other thing we learn is, yeah, it's confirmed Master Org knew Cole and his parents back in the day. And, again, supposedly died alongside them. Three's a crowd. The Rangers learn of an org that's kidnapping brides. This angers Danny to a comedic degree, constantly going on about how love is the most important thing in the entire world. The org is attacking another wedding, but this time the Rangers show up and fight it. During the fight, however, Danny runs into Kendall, getting flustered and lovesick all over again. It's pretty cute if I'm being honest. They don't stop the org, but Danny doesn't seem to be too concerned. He says he should warn Kendall about this, since she delivers flowers to weddings. When he shows up though, there's another guy trying to get her attention. The two then squabble for Kendall's affection. During this though, the org returns again, Kendall getting hurt in the process, and Danny fights off the putrids, telling the guy to take Kendall away to safety. And when he thinks the coast is clear... Yeah! Wild access! The rangers show up and run off the baddies. The attack landed Kendall in the hospital. Danny made her a homemade bracelet to cheer her up, but when he gets there, the other guy, we'd never learn his name, pulls Danny away, saying there's no way he can balance keeping Kendall happy and being a ranger. Danny depressingly agrees, just asking at the very least she gets his bracelet, before being called away to fight the org. The guy gives Kendall Danny's bracelet along with an expensive necklace he bought. However, Kendall clearly treasures Danny's gift much more. So she runs out of the hospital and onto the battlefield, telling Danny she understands and supports him 100%, all while wearing his bracelet. This makes Danny go Super Saiyan. Fueled and motivated by love, he has the strength to fight off every single putrid and org by himself. It's so heartwarming, he's like an excited child. We've all felt this way in life about one thing or another. And they of course destroy the org. The episode, however, ends with Kendall saying she doesn't want Danny to focus on protecting her, and should instead focus on the ranger's mission. It's not a flat-out rejection, but it's more like, I'll be here when you're done. She feels guilty at first, but smiles when he sees Danny is surrounded by people who love him. A Father's Footsteps It's an Alyssa episode. Kinda similar to Max's, we learn that Alyssa's father created the tiger fighting style, and he wanted Alyssa to run the dojo when he retires. But Alyssa wanted to go to college and learn about nature and animals and stuff, so he eventually let her pursue it. The episode mainly follows Alyssa wanting to make her dad proud of her. He learns that Alyssa has been skipping class, but it's because an org was attacking the city. He's initially super disappointed, but learns that she's the White Ranger, and utilizing their family's fighting style against the orgs, which he's happy about. That's about it. A nice and simple heartwarming episode. Lots of slower and more character-driven dialogue. Good luck, my White Tiger. Sing Song. Master Org confirms, again, that yes, he was the third dead scientist with Cole's family. The villains create an org out of the headstone. This somehow makes it so it can never be destroyed. The rangers do battle with it, however, it's really powerful, damaging the wild zords. Just then though, another wild zord shows itself, a deer zord. It's able to momentarily put the org to sleep before running away, Merrick remarking that the deer still must be angry with him. We learn that back in the day, Princess Shayla and Merrick used to sing to the deer zord every day. 
God, please no! Alright, it's actually not that bad. I hate that it kind of grew on me. From your oceans, the fish school and However, when the Great Org War began, they stopped singing, and thus the deer never showed itself ever again. Merrick tries to explain that, but the deer doesn't care. Bad timing, too, since the Org has woken up, but the Zords are still injured. So, Merrick and the princess know what they must do. From your skies. Yes, so they sing the song and... I guess it wins back the trust of the Deer Zord, which for some reason, Alyssa gets its animal crystal. It can combine with the Zord and together they destroy the monster. The episode ends with Princess Shayla telling Merrick she promised the deer they'd sing to it every morning, which Merrick is low-key happy about. I haven't mentioned this yet, but this season does a fantastic job with all the different Zord combinations. I love seeing all of them and the weapons they get with their disposal. Later seasons would go a bit overboard to the point where I don't remember what Zords do what, but here it's perfectly utilized, setting up each Wild Zord and giving their debut some grandeur. The Wings of Animaria Master Org revives General Nazor, turning him into Super Nazor. He's so strong he actually kills Alyssa, Danny, Max, and Taylor. I say that because later on they wake up in this purgatory, and this little child says, You've been given a second chance. So, they died. However, the second chance this kid's talking about is the chance to solve a puzzle and return back to life. A literal puzzle. Doesn't look too hard, to be honest. Meanwhile, Cole and Merrick are fighting for their lives by themselves. The Rangers eventually solve the puzzle and get rewarded with a new Wild Zord. The Falcon. It comes with a new blaster. As well as... Yup, a Battleizer mode that turns Cole into the Red Savage Warrior. And finally, for the first time in a long time, the Battleizer doesn't look stupid. The gold armor is simple, but meshes well with the Ranger's color, since gold is already their secondary color. And the big Falcon wings make sense since, well, there's the Falcon power-up. And with this new power, the Rangers destroy Super Nazor, sending him back to the grave for good. And now, it's time for the always classic and always beloved team-up episode. I've been looking forward to this one, because it's time for... Reinforcements from the Future, Part 1. We start off with Taylor speeding in her new car, and she gets pulled over by a familiar-looking body. Did you give her a ticket? Yep. Meanwhile, these three creatures have appeared in Turtle Cove. They don't speak any recognizable language. Gingerax and Toxica try to give them commands, as they sense org blood in them. But they don't listen, swatting them away and heading to the city. Wes and Eric show up, sensing that they're mutants. They fight them on more for a bit, but after realizing how powerful they are... Time for... Quantum Power! Wes and Eric put up a good fight, with some really cool cinematography that hasn't been seen in the series yet. The Wild Force Rangers, though, show up and send them packing momentarily. The Time Force Rangers demorph, and when Taylor recognizes Eric as the cop who gave her a ticket, she immediately demorphs to give him a hard time. However, they all still leave on somewhat good terms. The Time Force duo make a call to Trip in the future, asking if any mutants have gone back in time to 2002. Trip confirms that's the case, and also that Jen was in charge of tracking them down, but they lost contact with her a week ago. Wes and Eric then meet up with Taylor, who takes them to the Animarium to discuss the situation. Princess Shayla says that the three monsters are indeed orgs, but none she's ever encountered before. Trip says they may have an idea for some reinforcements. We then see Katie and Lucas gathering the help. First up is Nadira, who's now reformed and working at a daycare, as well as heading to the prison to recruit Rancic. We get a bit of calm before the storm. Eric and Taylor seem to be bonding a bit more, and Cole is surprised to see other Power Rangers, with Wes dropping a bit of foreshadowing, saying there are other Power Rangers all over the place. Just then, the three monsters show up, and the Wild Force Rangers, along with Wes and Eric, jump into action. They all do battle once again. However, even with the extra forces, the Rangers are still overpowered. One of the orgs is about to destroy Wes, but gets blasted at the very last second by a figure in the distance. Rocking some very attractive leather, I'm just saying. Again, this cinematography and choreography is fantastic. She causes enough damage and helps the Rangers run away. The episode ends with the monsters making it to Master Org's base and pledging their allegiance to him. Reinforcements from the Future, Part 2. The rest of the Time Force Rangers arrive in the past, along with Nadira and Rancic. Jen sees this and is immediately confrontational, but Cole is able to read Rancic's heart and tells Jen that he's changed. 
Rancic says that these creatures are actually mute orgs. He explains that when he was shunned away from humans, he came across an old org temple. They were calling out to him, saying they wanted to destroy humans. He released the org spirits and they took form by stealing some of Rancic's life force, giving them physical bodies, making them half org, half mutant. The mute orgs plan on doing some mass pollution at a factory, so the rangers get one night of rest before they attack. It's really nice. Wes and Jan are catching up, happy to be able to have another moment together as well as a new potential relationship between Eric and Taylor. Despite starting off on the wrong foot, they've clearly cracked each other's rough exteriors. Hey, I was in the Air Force. I could probably teach you a few things about this. The next morning, the Rangers jump into action. It's a really good action sequence. The last episode was all talk, so now it's time to focus on the fighting. One of the teams is walking straight into the front door and fighting off the forces. Another team is snuck into the back to hack the systems and shut down the pollution. Cole, Wes, Rancic, and Nadira are the third team, who end up getting jumped by the mute orgs. They wipe the floor with the rangers, and even landing a devastating blow on Adira. This angers Rancic, who fights back valiantly, but is still no match. The mute orgs join forces for a massive attack, using all their energy. While they're charging it though, Rancic knows what he has to do. He runs into the mute orgs and absorbs the blast for himself, to save not only his daughter, but the rangers. The mute orgs retreat momentarily. Rancic saying that power was enough to strip them of their mutant halves. And he seemingly dies. The rest of the rangers regroup, with Merrick showing up at the last second. And with all 12 rangers here... Ready! Now, this is probably the coolest morphing sequence in Roll Call to date. However, due to copyright reasons, I can't show it. But I can show a reenactment. Shout out to Austin Jones, the Omni Ranger, for this. Follow him here. Roll that Roll Call! Blazing line! It's so perfect. The rangers morph and of course beat up the mute orgs in a spectacular fashion. The choreography has been unreal this entire crossover. And with the red rangers using their battleizers, they destroy the mute orgs. A job well done. Not only that, but Rancic has also somehow been cured of this mutation. The episode ends with a fun montage of the two teams just hanging out. Danny and Katie are arm wrestling, Max is trying to flirt with Nadira, Taylor and Eric are also flirting. A perfect and happy ending to a strong crossover episode. Reinforcements from the Future is probably tied with the best crossover episode since To the Tenth Power. Both crossovers do what needs to be done. The current Ranger team interacts with the past team, continues the current story while also wrapping up loose ends with the previous season. There's a few things you could make fun of, sure. Like Rancic enjoying this lovely picnic with his new friends, but probably still going to jail when they return to the future. The Mute Orc's costumes were also all reused props from the previous seasons. You can tell one of them is obviously Deviat from Lost Galaxy. Apparently, Gal Ranger had a movie that used three new monster suits, but they were lost in a fire and the team had to improvise. As a whole, though, this crossover's quality felt different in a good way. There were a lot of character moments. Part 1 had tons of talking and development not usually seen in Power Rangers with dialogue that felt mature and not like they were trying to talk to dumb little kids. Characters were actually given time to, well, build character. It wasn't just rushing from scene to scene to sell toys. The action also felt very serious and realistic. The best way I can describe it is almost like the show was trying to mature along with its audience. The two-parter was written by a man named Emit Bomek. His name will come up again later in this season, because he's personally responsible for what I consider to be the best episode of Power Rangers ever, as well as being involved with the next season of the show, Ninja Storm. He's an interesting person in the Power Rangers history. It seems like Emit was serious about the show. He didn't view it as a stupid toy commercial that you could just write cheesy dialogue for because kids are dumb. He wanted to treat Power Rangers like a serious action show with its rich lore and characters, and I really respect him for that. It's why I'm torn on whether or not this is better than To the Tenth Power. I wouldn't feel weird showing this episode to my friends who aren't into Power Rangers. Nothing about it is silly or cheesy. It's a great crossover that makes both the Time Force and Wild Force Rangers look like heroes. I love it. Search it out if you get the chance. For now, though, let's move on with Wild Force. The Master's Last Stand. Toxica and Gingerax are searching for... something. 
Meanwhile, Master Org realizes that he doesn't have much time to stop the Rangers, since he's been found out as a big fat phony. Back in Turtle Cove, they've apparently found the body of Dr. Adler, the third scientist that was presumed dead with Cole's parents. The Rangers show up to the hospital, with Cole the most excited. He runs into the room, but it's a trap. All the Rangers get knocked out and wake up in an empty warehouse, where Dr. Adler confirms what we already know. He is Master Org. He has the Rangers tied up in vines, and explains what happened to Cole's parents. Long ago, he was once in love with Cole's mother. However, his father ended up marrying her. Master Org felt like this was a massive betrayal on his end, and never forgave the two. One day, while doing fieldwork about the Animaria, Dr. Adler found the remnants of the real Master Org. Feeling like he was pushed to the edge, he eats the seeds and obtains the power of Master Org. And kills Cole's parents. Yeah. They're confirmed dead by the man who did it himself. This devastates Cole, instantly falling into a deep depression. It's pretty brutal. Master Org just smacks him around and beats the crap out of him, and Cole doesn't care. Eventually, though, he comes to. This really cool moment where he's firmly planted in the ground and Master Org can't move him. I swore with my life to protect all of nature. Cole morphs and fights Master Org one on one. Merrick shows up to free the others. It's another really intense fight. Cole absorbs Master Org's blast and shoots it back at him. This blast completely stripping Master Org of his powers, turning him back into Dr. Adler, a pathetic, weak, and angry man. The Rangers try to walk away, but he taunts Cole, saying he's weak just like his parents, and even spitting at him. Seriously, this does not feel like Power Rangers. Finish me! But Cole tells him that revenge turned him into this pitiful man, and he won't go down that same path. Dr. Adler tries to return back to his base, but Toxica and Gingerax have revived a powerful org that will be their new leader, Mandalock. He blasts Master Org off a mountain and seemingly kills him. But the episode ends with Dr. Adler growing a real horn. Unfinished business. Merrick feels the disturbance. In the force, I guess, since Disney owns Power Rangers. When he goes to investigate it, he sees a familiar face. Zanaku is back. He explains that the curse was lifted from Merrick, but the mask itself gained new life. Merrick fights with Zanaku, but when the Rangers show up to help, Merrick angrily tells them to stay out of it. He once again feels responsible for Zanaku and stubbornly wants to do this by himself. The episode's lesson, of course, being Merrick needing to learn he has friends who now want to help. I would sacrifice my life for my friends. We all would. Again, it's so weird hearing death casually mentioned on Power Rangers. I really like it. With the power of friendship, the Rangers defeat Zanaku once and for all. They throw a party on the Animarium for Merrick. However, he doesn't show up, and instead plays pool. Homecoming. Cole runs into a troubled kid named Kite, which is obviously a fake name. He has no family or home, and Cole feels bad for him. Meanwhile, Mandalock creates two new generals that attack the city. The Rangers try to fight, but this damn kid keeps showing up and interfering, saying he loves nature and doesn't want to see it destroyed. That's like 80% of the episode. When the Rangers try to call the Wild Zords, they don't respond. Kite takes Princess Shayla and Merrick to a construction site, where they're apparently building over an old ancient burial ground for the Wild Zords. Because of this, the spirits are angry and won't allow contact with the other Wild Zords. Princess Shayla and Merrick use their powers to remove it and restore it to its former glory, allowing the Rangers to summon the Zords and destroy the Org. The episode ends with everyone moving the shrine to a new location, giving it the respect it deserves. The Flute Mandalock creates a new org that makes an annoying flute noise. During Merrick and the princess's morning song to the Deer Zord, the org's flute interrupts it and makes it sound like garbage. Or at least, you know, worse than it already does. This angers Princess Shayla, saying Merrick sucks at the flute and is ruining their time together, saying he didn't even want to be here in the first place. It seems like a bit of an overreaction at first, but will actually make some sense come the end of the episode. The rest of the episode has the flute org singing its awful song and making everyone dance. Yeah, it's stupid. Anyway, we learn that this flute incident was just the straw that broke the camel's back with Merrick and the princess. Ever since his return, Merrick has isolated himself from the Animarium. Like in the last episode, when he didn't show up to his own party. This has been wearing on Princess Shayla since, for 3,000 years, she thought that the man she loved was dead. And now that he's back, he won't stick around. Merrick explains that being on the Animarium is hard for him, reminding him too much of his past friends but that he does love singing with the princess every morning. It's a really touching episode, 
Princess Shayla was being such a brat, saying things like, Merrick is stupid anyway and can't play the flute. It was weird at first, but the payoff was so worth it. So, how do you think the duo stopped the flute org? Each day when the sun rises. However, when it's time for the Megazord fight, a new set of Wild Zords come down to assist. They're like alternate costumes for the Wild Zord. It turns out this is Animus making himself present, who apparently was supposed to be destroyed along with Master Org 3,000 years ago. The episode ends with Merrick and Princess Shayla making up, ready to sing their song for the deer tomorrow morning. Team Carnival so the rangers hang out with Kite at the carnival since he has no family, or home, or anything. It turns out though this carnival is owned by Gingerax and his brother who run amok. The episode is kinda boring from the rangers' perspective. What's more interesting is that this is kind of a Gingerax episode. Mandalock called him useless, so he felt terrible and teamed up with his brother to prove Mandalock wrong. However, the rangers of course end up winning and even killing Gingerax's brother. After his defeat, Toxico comforts Gingerax. You are not worthless. I'm proud of you. Really, Toxica? Yes. I can't believe I'm saying this, but this episode made me love these two. I don't want to see them lose. The episode comes to an end, though, with Kite saying he feels like he recognizes Merrick, feeling like they've met before. Taming of the Zords. An org shows up that's able to control the Wild Zords. He's like a carnival guy with a whip and the hat. The whole episode has the rangers trying to break them free of the org's control. However, that is until Kite shows up. He demands the Wild Zords to stop, apparently having an immense power of his own. Kite's power breaks the spell and the rangers destroy the org. So what's up with Kite? And do I really care? Not really, if I'm being honest. Monitoring Earth. Kite's watching TV and sees all the damage humans have done to the Earth. This angers Kite, but Taylor tells him to shut up and that he's just a kid. Which is kinda funny. Kite runs away, but Mandalock finds him, trying to convince Kite that he's on their side. Humans are evil and need to be destroyed. Which Kite agrees with, saying how the Rangers are supposed to be guardians of the Earth and should never have let this happen. Mandalock then revives. I'm ready to go! Goldart, I guess and the rangers fight. And then, literally out of nowhere, Kite regains his memory, I guess, and reveals his true identity. He is Animus, where he single-handedly destroys the org. However, he's still not pleased with what he's seen on Earth. He says humans aren't worthy of being saved. Too much has changed in 3,000 years. The episode ends with Animus taking away the wild doors from the rangers. And because of that, Princess Shayla also falls into a deep sleep that could last forever. The Soul of Humanity All of the Rangers are depressed about losing their Wild Zords, and almost consider giving up. But Danny of course spouts that NEVER GIVE UP line that's been said 256 times this season. And the Rangers continue their fight. Animus offers Merrick a chance to leave Earth with him and go somewhere far away from humans. But Merrick doesn't go choosing to instead believe in the human spirit. Animus witnesses an org destroying a building and people fleeing. There's a little girl trapped under some debris, but just then, everyone comes rushing back in to help, proving Animus wrong. Humans do care about each other, and despite not being perfect, will show up when duty calls. Animus then changes his mind, giving the rangers back their wild zords, and together, they all defeat the org. The episode ends with, all of this just being a test. A test of the Rangers' will to see if they would keep fighting without their Zords. Animus saying he's no longer needed on Earth, having full faith in the Rangers. And Cole gets a cool new toy motorcycle. The end. So yeah, that wraps up the Animus arc, and uh... It was all honestly kinda pointless. Why did Animus turn into a little kid and get his memory wiped? Heck, was his memory ever wiped in the first place? Or was all of that a test to see how the Rangers would treat a random kid in need of help? If that's the case, why? And also, why did the Rangers need to be tested in the first place? Not once in this season have they ever shown signs of laziness or anything. They left their regular lives to be dedicated to the Ranger cause and fight the orgs. So showing up randomly and taking away the Wild Zords as a test feels completely pointless. Easily the low point of the season. This arc just went on for way too long. However, we're about to be rewarded with the next episode that I personally consider to be the absolute best episode of Power Rangers to ever exist. 
Forever Red. The episode starts off with the Beetleborgs. Okay, no wait. These are surviving generals of the Machine Empire. Them and the Cogs are on the moon looking for something. But they're not alone. A man in a familiar red hood is spying on them. It's worse than I thought. Andros gets spotted, but flies away on his galaxy glider. We then cut to a poolside bar with... Why, I even once met Lord Zed and Rita. Yeah? So did I. They get a phone call and hand it to the man in charge. Whoever he is. Meanwhile, back in Turtle Cove, a man in a Hummer pulls up and talks to Cole. I'm Carter Grayson. Lightspeed Rescue. Cole's been recruited for a secret mission. Carter takes him to the Nasada space station, where they meet up with the rest of the team. There's a nice reunion with Wes and Eric, as well as... TJ and Andros are of course part of the team, along with their leader. Of course, who else would it be other than Tommy? Tommy explains all of the Rangers have been chosen for an important mission. It's dangerous, and they of course don't have to go, but come on, a room full of Red Rangers? Of course, they all immediately agree. Andros asks, isn't there another Red Ranger from Earth? With Tommy saying, guess he couldn't make it. Just then though, Cole hears a motorcycle outside. You didn't think I was gonna let you do this without the original Red Ranger, did you? And with that, the most powerful team of Rangers assembled gets ready for their mission. Meanwhile, on Miranoi, Back on the Astro Megaship, Tommy briefs everyone on the situation. General Vengix, no, not that one, and other generals of the Machine Empire are searching for something on the moon. Serpentera. Lord Zed, I guess, abandoned Serpentera on the moon. Andros has been keeping tabs on this, but now it's too late. The Machine Empire is going to use its technology to give it life once again, and hopefully a new battery since that thing was dying every five minutes. The Rangers then infiltrate the Empire's base, walking in the front door with a full frontal assault. We then get an amazing unmorphed fight with the Cogs. Every Ranger gets a chance to shine here. Jason and Tommy still got it with their spin kicks. Eric is also really impressive. Andros' stunt double goes hard. And Carter, he's got a gun. God bless Lightspeed. Cole gets blasted out of the base, but gets rescued by Leo and Oriko. And with all ten Red Rangers together... From the beginning of the franchise up until now, it's such an emotional trip down memory lane. This is easily the best looking fight scene in the franchise so far. There's a lot of cool slow motion shots and wire work, it's amazing. One by one, the Rangers destroy the Machine Empire. General Vengex, however, manages to board Serpentera, and there's only one thing that can stop it. Cole summons the Wild Force Rider, and with its power of bad CGI, destroys Serpentera. The episode ends with a job well done and all the Red Rangers having a bit of banter. So that was Tommy. He really is the greatest Ranger. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. After all, I was the one that replaced him. Are you kidding me? I was the one doing all the work while he was at the juice bar kissing on Kimberly. Forever Red is such a fantastic episode. As mentioned before, it was written by Amit Bomek. The entire episode has a mature tone. There's lots of slower moments, taking their time with the dialogue and character interactions. There's a lot of cheesy moments, sure, but it's not cheesy in the sense of Mighty Morphin Teamwork is Magic cheesiness. The cheesiness feels more like something you'd see in an 80s action movie. You know, if you miss King Mondo that much, I promise we can help you join him. I like how the lore of the past seasons all came into play here. Obviously, you could tear it apart. Why does Jason have his power coin? The turbo powers were destroyed. Why is Serpentera on the moon? Yada yada. Personally, I've always believed that Zordon sacrificed not only wiped out all of evil, but restored all past and destroyed powers. Being the 10th anniversary, it's amazing this was able to be pulled off with the quality it has. Because it almost didn't happen. First off, you'll notice that Leo, or Danny Slavin, hardly appeared in the episode. He had one line and then morphed. If you look closely at every other scene he's in, he's just poorly photoshopped. The Rangers all do a knuckle bump and he's not there. But then he is, just laughing away. Apparently, Danny didn't want to do the episode considering it was the same team that worked on Trakina's Revenge. And, well, it was the worst crossover ever. 
along with some other personal issues with them apparently. However, he did end up agreeing to film as a favor to one of the producers. By the time he agreed though, the episode was pretty much already done filming, hence all the Photoshop scenes. There's also a certain Red Ranger that didn't show up. Rocky. Poor Rocky, nobody likes him. Apparently he moved and they lost his contact information, but it doesn't really matter considering they were only going to call him if Austin St. John couldn't make it. Plus, 10 is a nice number. 11 Red Rangers celebrating the 10th anniversary doesn't feel as right. I'm sorry, Rocky. The episode was also intended to be an hour-long special as opposed to 30 minutes. Obviously, that would have been much better. There were moments that definitely felt rushed, like the recruiting scenes. There's a couple of deleted scenes you could find online. It's nothing crazy, just cut dialogue from scenes we already have. Yeah, let's go. I'm sorry. Only Cole was selected for this special mission. Well, that pirate diva talks turned me into a chimp. Yeah, I remember that. I was there too. At the end of the episode, when all the rangers are talking smack about how they're the best, Andro says, Hey, I saved two worlds. What about that? But originally, his line was, Hey, I'm the one that destroyed Zordon. Which was cut, because obviously, why would you brag about that? The main issue people have with this episode is Cole's magic motorcycle that one-shot Serpentera, a Zord that literally destroys planets. I've heard this is because Saban is, as we already know, a cheap little gremlin, so when they ran out of budget, they decided to team up with a toy company to make this toy, and that money helped them finish the episode. I can't find anything to really prove that, but it makes sense. But overall, I personally still think this remains as one of the best episode of Power Rangers. It's, screw it, the best! Serious plot, serious drama, fantastic action and fan service for everyone who's been watching since day one. There's a nice behind the scenes vlog Jason David Frank filmed all the way back in 2002. It's made its way onto YouTube and it's a nice watch. So hey, with all that yapping out of the way, let's continue with Wild Force. The Master's Herald Part 1 Mandalock creates a new general, Onekage, after ripping into Toxica for being useless. However, Onekage has a plan. The rangers are fighting orgs in the city. During this though, Toxica somehow makes it onto the Animarium to kidnap Princess Shayla. You can fight? Yeah, what? You can fight? I'm pretty sure there's like 15 scenarios where that could have been useful. So the princess and Toxica fight, however Toxica's magic gives her the advantage. Orgs aren't able to usually survive on the Animarium. However, Toxica explains that Onikage told her to cut off her horn, promising it would grow back. She brings the princess to Mandalock. Just then though, Toxica collapses. Orgs can't live without their horns, and Onikage tricked Toxica to get the job done. The rangers then use this distraction to blast at Mandalock, but he quickly grabs Toxica and uses her as a shield, where she dies. The rangers manage to fend off Onikage, but the episode ends with them in despair their princess now in the hands of the enemy. The Master's Herald Part 2 Mandalock forces the rangers out of hiding with taunting the princess out in public. Just then though, someone makes their return. Master Org is back, with his real horn this time. It turns out Onikage was working for Master Org this whole time, and in one clean blast, Master Org destroys Mandalock. He also doesn't want Jindrax around anymore, but before he can destroy him, he teleports away with the princess. While on the run, Princess Shayla tries to connect with Jindrax, asking why him and Toxica blindly follow orders instead of thinking for themselves. Onikage finds the two, but when he goes to attack Jindrax, Princess Shayla jumps in to save him, where he ends up returning the favor. The rangers manage to destroy Onikage, but the princess still remains a prisoner of Master Org, Merrick specifically feeling responsible, being the princess's protector. Fishing for a friend Toxica makes contact with Jindrax via a magic mirror Onikage had. She tells him that the power that put her there is the same that can bring her back. Jindrax realizes that to save Toxica, the rangers need to use the jungle blaster on Toxica's horn. Wait, have I even mentioned this thing yet? It's a new set of weapons based off the new set of wild zords. It's fine. During a fight with an org, Jindrax shows up to help the rangers defeat it. Right when they use the blaster, he jumps in the line of fire to blast Toxica's horn, risking his life to save his friend. With that blast, it somehow revives Toxica's horn, and he's able to use a fishing rod to get her out of purgatory. The episode ends with the two hanging out in a park at night like they're Scott Pilgrim and Ramona, and decides it's time for them to look out for themselves and serve no master. A really charming episode for the two. The rangers once again just played a background part. 
Sealing the Nexus Toxica finds out that Master Org has the princess. She remarks that he also has access to the princess's necklace, which will grant him great power, allowing Master Org to find anyone he wants, including them. So they team up with the rangers. Kinda. They tell them that in order to get to the Nexus and rescue the princess, they need to find five pillars of light and destroy them. The pillars are guarded by resurrected villains. They destroy the pillars and need to fight the three generals. Meanwhile, it's Jindrax and Toxica who sneak into the Nexus to save the princess. They run into Master Orc, who's just meditating. But suddenly, he starts to disintegrate like a Thanos snap. The Nexus is also caving in on itself, so Jindrax and Toxica leave the Nexus in time with the princess. And the Rangers defeat the Orgs. Everyone's reunited together once again. Master Org is seemingly destroyed, the princess is back with the rangers, and Toxica and Jindrax, for the first time, are free and happy. They don't leave as buddies with the rangers, but they won't be fighting anymore, planning on living their lives together and seeing where the wind takes them. A very happy ending for the two. It's a fun episode. Ideally, this would be the end of Wild Force. However, life doesn't always work out how you expect because now we've reached the finale, the end of Wild Force, with the two-parter, The End of the Power Rangers, Part 1. The Rangers are celebrating their victory on the Animarium. The Power Rangers are over! Oh yeah. Now everyone's sad, thinking about what life will be like now that the Earth doesn't need them. This time of peace is short-lived though, because back at the Nexus, this Org heart starts beating, and Turtle Cove gets covered in vines. Master Org has returned, now in full Org form, not having any piece of his humanity left. The Rangers fight him, but his power is too much, not standing a chance. Master Org grows giant, but just then, Animus shows up. Merrick joins in the fight, saying he failed to protect Animus 3,000 years ago and wants to right his wrong today. The Megazords fight valiantly, but once again, Master Org is just too powerful, destroying the Predazord. Merrick reaches for his animal crystals, but they all shatter, along with his morpher. The Rangers take Animus, still taking the form of Kite, back to the Animarium, where he tells the Rangers that they're the Guardians of the Earth, before... dying. Oh my god, yeah, this kid straight up dies in Power Rangers! There's no time for grieving though. Master Org makes his way onto the Animarium and starts wreaking havoc. The Gorilla, Giraffe, Twin Bears, Rhino, and Armadillo Zord show up to fight. They form the Konga Zord and do battle. It puts Master Org to sleep and the Rangers use their final strike, but it's not enough. Now angry, Master Org strikes down the Konga Zord. One by one, the Animal Zords fall, and their crystals being destroyed in the process. The Ranger's last hope are their personal Wild Zords. They valiantly stand up to Master Org, but they are inevitably defeated and destroyed. The Rangers losing their own animal spirits, and thus their powers as well. Red Lion! It's an incredibly powerful and emotional scene. The episode ends with Master Org turning day into night, creating a torrential downpour on Turtle Cove, sending the Animarium crashing down to Earth. The End of the Power Rangers Part 2 Master Org is running amok, and the Rangers have no powers at their disposal to fight back. All seems hopeless. However, that won't stop the Rangers. They see people in trouble and immediately jump into action, rescuing civilians and fighting off the putrids unmorphed. Damn, this rainy scenery is beautiful. I'm surprised we've never gotten this up until now. The Rangers reach the rooftop and confront Master Org, leading to probably the most cheesy yet amazingly epic moment the series has ever seen. One by one, the rangers proclaim how they won't back down even if they're powerless, calling out their animal names and most importantly, how they will never give up. Blazing Light! Noble Tiger! Soaring Eagle! Surging Shark! Iron Vice! Howling Wolf! Guardians of the Earth! United we rule! And through the rangers' undying resolve, a mysterious power bursts through the heavens where hundreds, if not thousands of animal crystals come to help the rangers. Wild Zords never seen before, all coming from Animaria. They even use their powers to revive the rangers' Wild Zords, allowing them to morph and take on Master Org. With all the animal spirits, they create the Jungle Sword and use the Jungle Slash to strike down Master Org in one clean shot, ending his reign of terror, hopefully forever. With the ranger's mission coming to an end, so does their life as a Power Ranger. Princess Shayla will return the Animarium to the sky and watch over the Wild Swords until they're needed again. 
where she asked the rangers to turn in their morphers, as well as their team jackets? Kind of a dick move, honestly. Heck, Merrick even offers to stay with her on the Animarium, but she tells him no. He's a human and should stay on Earth. The episode comes to a close with everyone returning back to normal life. Cole gives his parents closure, as well as paying respects to Dr. Adler's grave, hoping he now knows true peace. Taylor rejoined the Air Force, Max and Danny traveled the world on a vacation, Merrick decided to travel the world as well to see where life takes him next, alongside Zenaku, who's still alive but looking to change his life. And Alyssa, she became a grade school teacher, telling the story of the Wild Force Rangers to her class. And with that, Power Rangers Wild Force, and Power Rangers as a whole, comes to an end. Power Rangers Wild Force was so much better than I remembered. Back in the day, I always felt like it was a big step down from Time Force in terms of maturity and storytelling, but after rewatching, this may be one of my favorite seasons of all time. It felt like they were trying to strike a balance between mature storytelling and fun and silly action plots for kids to follow, and the end result is great. When the story wanted to be serious, it was serious. Cole's parents being killed, his journey to find them only to realize he'd never got to meet them, Forever Red and reinforcements from the future had spectacular action and character moments. The season also felt most like an anime, a lot of cheesy moments that made this series great. The only real weak points in the show were Princess Shayla and Master Org. Princess Shayla I've already talked about, she was mostly useless and doughy-eyed, singing her stupid song 95% of the time and getting captured. She never once came off like a force to be reckoned with or respected. And taking away the Rangers jackets was such a dick move, like I can't get over that, give them something to remember their time together. And rejecting Merrick like that was so pointless. He's literally 3,000 years old. The Animarium will feel most like his home rather than the modern world where he has no one and is literally now just wandering the earth looking for something to do. Awful. Master Org was also just kinda there. Obviously the connection to Cole's family was very interesting, but they seemed to only have an arc's worth of stuff for him to do. Before learning about the connection to Cole's family, he was literally just there spawning monsters and complaining about defeat like Rita. Then he was destroyed and Mandalock took over for a bit, only for him to come back and now just be a big baddie with no other character traits. Everyone else was great though. Cole was an interesting fish out of water ranger. He's constantly shouting about never giving up and just gets his ass kicked time and time again, but he valiantly just pushes forward and shouts at the top of his lungs about never giving up. Taylor stayed fairly consistent throughout. She definitely eased up a bit fairly early on, no longer being nagging and by the book. She was just a strong ranger that easily led the team when duty called. Max and Danny remain lovable little scamps in their own little way. I like how they dropped the Max wanting to grow up story, because just like the Rangers, we didn't view him as a rookie anymore. Throughout the series, Max constantly stepped up to the plate and did his part. He grew confidence in himself, not worrying about being a kid. And instead, he was now simply a Power Ranger. Alyssa was also there. Yeah, probably the ranger with the least development, but she was the glue and heart that held the team together. She was the only one that never once gave up hope or lost hope, always wanting to push forward and fight no matter what, even when the other rangers felt let down. Merrick kind of confused me. His character was the lone wolf. His stories either revolved around wanting to be alone or feeling guilty about his past. I get that, but most of the time he just felt like a moody teenager. One moment he'd be happy hanging out with his friends, and the next he's yelling at them saying he wants to be left alone. I think if they wanted to commit to the lone wolf bit, he should have been a bit more like Eric was in Time Force. Not so much the a-hole personality, but more so just showing up when the town needed him. Wild Force was an A-plus season in my book, and with its story coming to a close, also comes the end of the Saban era of Power Rangers. It's why I used a bit of a montage with the Forever Red morph. Love it or hate it, this era of Power Rangers defined just what Power Rangers is. They didn't always knock it out of the park. Heck, sometimes the show was downright annoying and awful. But for the most part, seeing its evolution up to this point was beautiful. I'm really going to miss this era of Power Rangers. As an old man, it's what I consider to be my era of Power Rangers. But yeah, we say goodbye to the Saban era of Power Rangers, and at the time, this was once again supposed to be the end of the franchise. Disney had no interest in continuing Power Rangers, instead choosing to air reruns. However, the series did end up continuing. How? Well, 
Pack your bags and get ready to head to New Zealand when we continue our ranger journey with Power Rangers Ninja Storm.